morning. It's good to see you. And uh, I have the privilege of uh, being the first of the elders to start this uh, sermon series on the book of Colossians that um, we're going to be doing in the month of uh, December. So Jeremy, Quentin, Robert, and I are each going to be taking a portion of Colossians chapters 1 and 2. And uh, instead of focusing on the Christmas narrative and the Gospels that we typically would, we're going to focus on Christ from the book of Colossians, Christ being our hope, Christ being the image of the invisible God, Christ being the ultimate treasure, and Christ being the one that we proclaim. Now Christmas is often a time when, when people are feeling uh, more hopeful. We like, to, uh, we like to think of Christmas as a time where we sometimes put aside our differences. Uh, we sometimes think, uh, you know, if we uh, take a little more time to, to be kind and, and gentle, uh, we can get along a little bit better. Uh, people are more generous with one another. And of course, uh, many of us like to go and buy gifts. We like to bless each other with, with those sort of things. And we're, we're in society, we're feeling often just more hopeful of good things to come. Well, the past year may not have been the best, but uh, hopefully, you know, in society we think, well, with Christmas, things will improve. At least, you know, this will help us feel better about things in society. And, um, and if we show love and kindness towards one another, well, surely that's going to help the world and give us hope and give us encouragement and give us a better future and those sort of things. Well, for the world, that sort of hopefulness is, is a short season of hope. And it's not even a hope that is actually based on Jesus Christ. Um, people actually hope for all sorts of things, don't they? Think about the things that you hope for sometimes. We hope for peace. We hope for happiness. We hope for better things to come. We hope for improved health. Uh, sometimes we hope for improved, better financial situation. Uh, some of us hope for a good health, better health, and uh, a longevity of life. There's lots of things that, that we hope for. But there's also some things that people put their hope in. And so here's some examples of things that people often put their hope in. Uh, we often put our hope as a society in politicians. We hope to vote in the right guy or the right lady to, to rule the country or to rule the, uh, the province and to help solve societal problems. We often put our hope in doctors, that they're going to find cures for our ailments. We put our hope in medicine, that it's going to give us better health and keep us alive longer. We sometimes put our hope in economists, and we want them to curb the inflation. We put our hope in wealth specialists, investments, or as I saw the other day at about 6.30 in the morning at McDonald's, lottery tickets for our financial security. We put our hope sometimes in education. We want to become wiser. We want to become smarter. We want to have better jobs. We put our hope in military protection. Maybe not Canada so much as other countries, but uh, we do, as a general, put our hope in the, the military as a, as a nation. Uh, sometimes we put our hope in certain foods or certain eating habits that are going to make us healthier and live longer and be better. Sometimes... Though we also, don't we, put hope just in what we think sometimes in the good of people. That people will make good decisions. That they will be wise. That they will be helpful. That they'll do what's best. Sometimes we also put our hope in modern psychology to manage our anxieties and fix our relationship problems. Well, you see, the world, like us, we're part of the world, uh, we put our hopes in all sorts of things, but what we're going to do this morning is what we're going to learn that ultimately our hope rests in the Lord Jesus Christ and that our hope is laid for us up in heaven. So when Paul was in prison, he was writing this epi epistle to the, uh, the Colossians, this letter. He starts by writing about how thankful he is. And he's thankful for their faith. He's thankful for their love. He's thankful for the hope that they have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he begins this letter like he does all other 13 letters that we know that he wrote in the, in the New Testament with this little phrase in verse 2. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Um, he, he was not 
Um, he's not one of the, he wasn't one of the disciples of Jesus. He actually didn't spend time with, with Jesus to learn from him, and he was not in any in, inner circle like the disciples. In fact, he was a devout Jew who was instructed at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strictness of the law and his zealousness for God. He rejected Christ as his promised Messiah, and he made it his mission actually to persecute the Christians, sending them to prison for their faith and, and calling some of them to be stoned. Ultimately, he was trying to destroy the church. And here is what Paul says while on trial by King Agrippa. Now, I sort of say this because, again, he starts the book with this grace to you and peace from God our Father, and yet this is a bit of the history of Paul. When he was on trial with King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, he says this, and this is just what I did in Jerusalem, he says. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. And, and, and Paul, while he's on the road to Damascus to destroy the church, Jesus stopped him in his tracks. And he revealed himself to, Jesus, to, to, to Paul. And he poured out his grace on him and he gave him the gospel and Paul became saved. Paul went from being outside of the church to being in the church outside of the family of God to being transplanted and adopted into the family of God. And he was called by Jesus not only to salvation, but he was called by Jesus and he was commissioned to be an apostle unto the Gentiles. And what Paul realized from that transforming moment when he met Jesus is that his salvation and that his calling, it's not of himself, but it rather it comes from the grace of Christ. He who worked so hard to prove himself worthy and justify himself in God's sight, he came to see that he had nothing to offer God for his salvation. In fact, all of his hope was faulty and empty. His hope was in himself as a Jew, his pedigree as a Jew, and his zealous work that he did for the Lord. Amazingly, though, God saved him while he was on this mission to actually destroy the church and he called him to be an apostle of his. Paul's life was actually rooted in his confidence in his own flesh. It was about his own abilities, his own achievements apart from Christ. There was no grace there, and he was resting on it because it was all about him, it was about his Jewish blood, and it was about his obedience to the Mosaic law. When Jesus confronted him and rescued him from his sin, Paul finally understood what saving grace was and, and how it's actually the true foundation of true, long-lasting hope, which is laid up for us in, in heaven. He saw how deep and full and wide the grace of Christ was to rescue him being a wretch. And the power of God's grace in Paul was to transform him into a new man which I believe is one of the reasons why he begins all of his epistles, all of his letters to all of these churches with this simple phrase, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Sometimes he adds the word mercy in there as well. So in chapter one, Paul begins by saying that he's so thankful for the Colossians and that he's always praying for them. He never met them. He never planted a church there in Colossae. And yet, in his prayers, he's continually just thanking God for their faith and their love. And he's thanking them ultimately for these, these graces that God has given them, the grace of faith, the grace of hope, and the grace of love. So he's heard of their faith and how this grace has transformed their lives. And in fact, he almost writes the same thing to the Ephesians. If you go to Ephesians chapter one, verses 15 to 19, he says practically the same thing about them, thanking God for their faithfulness and their love and their faith. And so this, this just encourages heart so much. When Paul's praying, much of what he's praying about, because he says he prays about this continually, is thanking God for the love he, that people have for others, for the faith that they have in Christ and for their obedience in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But I ask you, what is this faith? What's so important about having faith in Jesus? You know, for us who've grown up in the church or for us who've been in the church for, for a long time, we tend to gloss over that sometimes. We tend to think, yeah, I've heard about that. I've done that. I've, I've you know, I, I've, I've done studies about that. I've read about that. And yet, uh, this is so essential that I don't want us to gloss over this element of having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, again, I ask you the question, what is faith? Well, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 actually defines it very clearly and very succinctly. It says this, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. See, as a Christian, we all have faith in Jesus, believing that he's the son of God, sent from heaven above, Faith is believing that Jesus was the spotless Lamb of God who, in joyful obedience to the Father, went to the cross to suffer and to be crucified for the forgiveness of our sins. It's the genuine belief that he is the way, he's the truth, he's the life, and that his death on the cross was actually necessary for the forgiveness of our sins. It's not just believing and understanding intellectually in our mind for even the demons clearly believe and understand the truth of this, but they're not saved by any sense of the imagination. But let me read that verse again. And what does it say? Let me ask you, what is faith? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You see, the word assurance could also be translated substance or confidence. It means that which is under something, that which is real. Putting faith in Christ is putting ourself under Christ, submitting to him, believing in him. Our faith is actually a firm foundation in that, it, it, in that which is real, which is Jesus being our savior. You see, God has given us confidence, he's given us assurance, he's given us a conviction of the promise of the new covenant which he made by the blood of Christ. And he promises salvation to all who call on the name of Jesus and to look to him and who depend on his grace alone for their salvation. You see, when we believe in him, our faith is the assurance of things hoped for and laid up for us in heaven. The very fact that you've been granted faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Without faith, it would be impossible to please the Lord. And without faith, there's no, no, no true things in heaven to, to hope for. To say it slightly differently, the assurance of your hope is that you have faith in Jesus and that he is God in the flesh who fully atoned for our sins on the cross. Faith isn't something that we conjure up. Faith isn't our human effort being produced. In contrast, our man-made faith actually has no assurance attached to it. No assurance whatsoever. The faith that God gives is always assuring. It always comes with assurance. It always comes with conviction and confidence, though we falter at times, but his faith does come with assurance. That's what it comes with. That's what it is in a sense. It is, a f it is our faith that looks to Christ himself as being the author of our salvation. I love what it says in Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. It says, by grace you have been saved through faith, the faith that we've just been talking about. And that is not of yourselves, it's rather a gift of God, not as a result of works. Why? So that no one can boast. True faith in Christ actually denies any works of our own to put us in good standing before God. And it looks to Jesus and his work of obedience and death uh, on the cross to justify us in God's sight. But in verse four here, uh, Paul also thanks God for the love which the Colossians have for all of the saints. You see, their faith is genuine and it's proven by their love for one another. 
As a family of God, they have a deep and abiding love for all the brothers and sisters, and they truly care for one another. Not only did they have a love for God, but they had a love for each other. Having been adopted into his family, it's actually a natural and an expected thing that we show love and express care and true, deep, genuine love for for each other. True faith in Christ is naturally going to express itself in that way, though don't get me wrong, it is a challenge at times to do that. (coughs) But what is this love? Again, we want to define and understand what faith is. Paul's thanking God for this faith. We understand what this is now. But he also thanks them for their love for the Lord Jesus Christ and the love for the saints ultimately. What is this love? What does love look like? The love of God, how does that materialize itself? Well, Paul actually addressed that back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where it says, beginning in verse 4, love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. It does not brag. It's not puffed up with ourself. It does not act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. Other versions say not easily provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It doesn't keep track of wrongs that other people have done. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness but rather it rejoices in the truth, what is true. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes in all things. It endures all things. And ultimately, love never fails. Love never fails. This is the love that they're showing one another. This is the love that they're expressing and that they're happy to do because Christ has first love them. And he continues in verse 5 by talking about the the, the hope that is laid up for them in heaven. Let's capture the context of this. And in verse 3 he says, in, in Colossians, he says, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, also it constantly bearing fruit and multiplying, just as it has been doing in you also since the day that you heard and understood the grace of God in truth. All right, we're back on. The hope that he's talking about comes from the word of truth. It comes from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you just hold the Bible, this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is where the hope comes from, Christ revealed in the scriptures. Put your hands on your Bible for a second. It's, it's not the physical Bible, but it's the word of God whereby we get the hope that we need through Christ in scriptures. If you scoot down to verse 27 in chapter one of Colossians, it says this, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. He talks about hope in multiple other places, and here he says it's the hope of glory. And part of the hope that we have is of future glory because Christ has risen from the dead, conquered, the de- conquered sin and death. He's, we have a future hope, a future glory with him. Uh, I like what it says also in Galatians 5, verse 5. It says, For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. Our hope is also described as a hope of righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ ultimately imputed or credited to our account. It's a a hope of righteousness 
that as we live in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we will be living a righteous life. So it's a hope of righteousness for as I obey, I will be living a life of righteousness. But it's a hope of righteousness ultimately for I will be credited with the righteousness of Christ because what is our righteousness? It's not ourselves. It's not our works truly. It's Christ in us. He is our righteousness. You see, our hope is firm and it's a steadfast hope that's anchored in Christ Jesus and what he has done for us on the cross. It's a hope that, that comes from the gospel. The good news that, that Jesus lived a perfect life that we can't live. He died on the cross in place of our, 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 our position. And he, it was our substitute so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Because he lived the perfect life and he rose from the dead. He conquered death. He overcame sin. He destroyed the work of the devil and he brought freedom to all of us who were captive to the law and its requirements. Freedom from the requirements of the law which required us to be condemned for our sins. The hope that we have is by his grace, not our works of performance. I don't know about you, but sometimes we have good days and bad days and sometimes on the good days we feel like Yay, things are going good. I'm reading my Bible. I'm actually obeying more than I ha did the other day uh, and those sort of things. And, and, and we begin to feel that our performance is what it's about. And, and don't get me wrong. It's, it's good to feel good about those things, but it's, it's not about our performance. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our hope. Our hope is not in our performance, right? In school, we often have tests. We have to perform to pass well, we know with God, we all fail. Day one, we all have to go to him who writes the test for us. He lived the perfect life for us that we couldn't live. And when we put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we then get credited with his perfection, with his obedience, with his righteousness that we could never, ever earn. His grace is this unmerited favor on our lives. And we already saw that in the life of Paul how he had no true hope of salvation until he actually abandoned his works and he received the grace of Christ. True hope, my brothers and sisters, comes only by the grace of God through faith in Christ. So basic, but so necessary. It's the only path that leads to salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4 says this, talking about Christ being our living hope. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, having been kept in heaven for you. You see, our hope is a living hope because our hope is in Jesus Christ who, although he died, he rose from the dead and conquered sin and death. He is our living hope who now rules at the right hand of God the Father. Our hope is, is a hope of glory, as it says in verse 21. And it's, it's, I want to come back to this a little bit. It's a natural thing for us to long for for heaven, to want to be in a place of glory. And each of us desires to, for, for a better place where we're not with, um, in this sin-cursed world which is plagued by our own sinfulness. The hope that it, each of us has is, is for an inheritance that's, that's reserved for us. We have reservations in heaven based on the blood of Christ. And ultimately, our inheritance is Christ himself. Often we think of heaven as a place where we get things. We have a big mansion and we have this and we have that or, or so on and so forth. And, and, and the Lord will bless us most definitely according to his pleasure, his good pleasure. But the true hope that we ultimately have is in having Christ Jesus. And we're going to see this a little bit further. It, it's having him and being near to him. He is ultimately our hope. I look forward to heaven because it's going to be a place 
where every decision, every thought, every action, and every motive is right and pure and honorable. A place where there isn't even the remotest possibility of disobedience to the Lord. But it's ultimately going to be Christ, our inheritance, which is going to be the greatest pleasure that I think we all honestly are going to have in heaven. Our future hope of glory is to be in the glory of his kingdom and to perfectly reflect him in his glory. It's to serve him perfectly all the time and to be able to truly love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, never faltering, but always growing. Never faltering, but always growing. And included in this hope of glory is actually our future resurrection. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11 that, and I quote, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If it wasn't for Christ raising from the dead, we would have no hope of a resurrection and to glory. Part of the hope that we actually have is to be with him and to have this incorruptible body that will forever give him glory in all perfection. Another element, though, of the hope of glory is to be conformed into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 says this. This is an incredibly humbling passage. It says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all of your conduct, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We all fail. And yet, the Lord is molding us. He's shaping us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And part of the hope of glory, part of the hope that's laid up for us in heaven, is that when we get there, the fullness of our being conformed into the Lord Jesus Christ will be our experience. It will be given to us. It, we will receive it quickly, and it will be the, a, an amazing, great joy to have that, that we should be thinking about and meditating upon as we anticipate being with our Lord and Savior. Think about the, um, think about the fact that, that God forgives us. That in itself is a marvelous thought. Not only, though, does he pardon us from all of the crimes that we've committed against him, but he then goes on to mold us and to shape us into the image of the eternal begotten Son of God, and permanently so. Although we were by nature sinners, crooked, bent, corrupt, dead, not worthy to be called his sons and daughters, he actually transforms us into the image of the Holy One, that's part of the amazing hope that we have that's laid up for us in Christ Jesus in heaven. Our hope is also a confident, joyful knowledge that we will be brought near to God by the blood of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, Paul reminds us that part of our hope is, to, is in being brought near to God. It says this, Remember that you were at that time without Christ, alienated from the citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But, verse 13, now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And to see a picture of this, of, of being brought near to God, I want us to go back to the Old Testament, to the life of David, and to an episode with a young man by the name of Mephibosheth. So I invite you to go back to 2 Samuel. We're going to read it together in just a little bit. 2 Samuel chapter 9. You may remember from the last time that I was preaching from Psalm 86 that David was uh, being hunted by King Saul, who hated him. And, and Saul went to great lengths to kill David on several occasions. Saul was David's enemy. 
He was evil, he was jealous, he was proud, and he, he was ultimately intent on murdering David. David was best friends, though, with Saul's son, Jonathan, and Jonathan loved David so much that he intervened on David's behalf. And there was what I would call a special, godly, brotherly, and committed love between Jonathan and David, the best of friends. And Saul and Jonathan, unfortunately, though, both died in a battle with the Philistines. David then becomes king, and in 2 Samuel chapter 9, he says this. Let's read it, follow along. We'll start in verse 1. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him loving kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. Verse 3, and the king said, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the loving kindness of God? And Ziba said to the, the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Am- Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David sent and took him from the house of Machir, the son of Emil from Lodabar. And so Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and he fell on his face and he prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, here is your servant. And David said to him, do not fear for I will surely show you loving kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, and you shall eat at my table continually. So he prostrated himself and he said, what is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? And then the king called Saul's young man Ziba and said to him, all that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him And you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food and eat of it. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table continually. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servants, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Now Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. And so Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem. And it repeats here again, for he ate at the king's table continually. And now now he was lame in both feet. You see, normally in those times when a king came to power, he would get rid of the previous king's family or any potential true heir or threat to the throne. But that isn't what David did. What he did is the very opposite. And instead of seeking to kill any and all who would be a potential heir or threat to the throne that he was on, he was seeking to bless those that were from Saul's household. That's what he says. So do you see here the picture of of, of grace, the picture of hope? Can you see the similarity, how Christ sought us who were his enemies, rescued us who were not part of his family, adopted us into his family, gave us a permanent place at his banqueting table? You see, just as David brought Mephibosheth, a lame person who was from the, the enemy's house, into his family, adopted him as a son, and said, come, eat at my table continually. Have what you need, I bless you. Have what what, what your your grandfather's household had. Christ has done the same for us. In fact, he's done greater, and this is just an Old Testament picture, I believe, of what Christ has done for us. Christ says, come near, 
You are now my family. Dine with me at my table. I have fully forgiven you. We were his enemy, and, we were, and, and he transferred us from darkness of our sin into the light of fellowship with him. We once feared for our soul, knowing that there is judgment to come for our sins, and yet he now says, call me Abba, Father. It says in 1 John chapter 4, 18, that perfect love drives out fear. The perfect love of God through Christ has driven out fear such that we no longer fear our death. Well, maybe the experience of death, but not what happens when we go to be with God after our death. We have no fear. Perfect love, the love of God, the love through Christ has driven out that fear so that we do not worry that we have to be taken to some corner, whipped and beaten a little bit before, you know, to finish paying what we need to pay for before he lets us into his kingdom. Nothing like that. He says you've been fully forgiven. You see, where we once were separated from him, we were brought close to an intimate, loving, safe relationship with him. We who were unworthy and without hope were pursued by Christ, the great shepherd, and brought into his fold. We who were outcasts are now welcomed at his table, always having a spot there. We who were useless and spiritually dead were given a new birth in Christ Jesus. And we who were on the broad path that was leading to destruction were plucked out of that and placed on the narrow path of peace and righteousness. We who were the enemies of the cross, enemy of of Christ, hostile against him, having rebelled against him and, and thrown up our fists against him and broken his commandments over and over and over again, have been pardoned and shown mercy. You see, what happened to Mephibosheth is a beautiful picture of what ultimately happens to us as God's children. And that's the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ that's laid up for us in heaven. What are you hoping for in life? What are you hoping for as we enter this Christmas season? Well, maybe you're like me and you're hoping for the salvation of loved ones. You know people that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are on the wrong path. Well, you can hope. What is the hope that God gives to us for that hope? Well, we can hope in Christ because he says this. There's power in the gospel for the salvation of all who believe. His word, he says, will not return to him void, and he's commanded us, in fact, to persevere and to pray for for the lost, and he saves all who call in the name of the Lord Jesus. With hope, let's remember the grace that was given to Saul, who ultimately became Paul, when we're praying for the unbelievers that we know. Maybe you're hoping for better health. What's the hope if you have health troubles? Well, there's ultimately a hope that we have in Christ because he knows our weakness. He has the power to heal. We see that all over the the New Testament, even in the Old Testament, the power to heal. And he promises to give us an an, 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 um, an incorruptible, resurrected, and glorified body that will one day have no sickness and no disease. That's our hope. Maybe you're watching the news or read the newspaper and you are hoping for peace in this world. Well, Christ, again, is our hope. He's always our hope. He's our hope for everything. And the hope that, I- that he gives us is laid up for us in heaven. He's our hope for this world because he is the Prince of Peace. He's the King of Kings and he's the Lord of Lords. A day is coming when he's going to rid this world of all evil and he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And our hope is also with this truth that he tells us in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, that the king's heart is like channels of water in the, y- in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he pleases. He's our hope for that. Maybe 
you're hoping for a sturdier or a more steady um, financial situation. Let me remind you of what it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Very simply and very shortly, it says, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. It doesn't matter how much you make, how little mate you make, whether you got the promotion and you think you're going to have it for a long time, or whether you got fired and you lost your job and now you've got to look for something new. He says, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Maybe you're hoping for something a little bit more on the inside, and that is for greater sanctification in your life. You look at your own life and you realize, uh, I'm not like Christ like I need to be. And it's discouraging because you know that you keep walking in these sins. You keep faltering. You keep tripping. You keep stumbling. And you keep repenting, but it sometimes just feels discouraging, doesn't it? What's the hope that God gives to us that's laid up for in heaven when we want to be and yearn to be and pray and, and, and strive to be sanctified in Christ Jesus? Well, John, join the apostle in his assurance of hope when he says this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. The work of God in you to sanctify you will never stop. He never takes a break. He never says, I'm done. I need a rest. This is too difficult of a case. <laughs> He's always working. Now, we're not always in step with him. We need to repent. We need to come back to Christ. We need to remember that he will do the work. It's not our place to give up and say, oh, well, it's not working. We need to Remember that the, the, the hope that we have in Christ is a living hope. And his living hope is to sanctify us. But also, don't forget this amazing promise. Memorize this one. Meditate upon this one. Hold it dear in your heart. Because in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, it says this. It says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. What more does God want in your life than your sanctification? He says this about that desire in us. Ask, seek, knock. He will give. He promises. He will work may not be on our timetable, may not be how we do it, but he will, because he promises. Maybe you're hoping for pain and sorrow to be gone. You've got pain in your life, you've got sorrow in your life of sorts. Well, I encourage you to memorize and meditate upon this grand truth in Psalm 34, verse 18. It says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And look joyfully to the day where it says in Revelation 21, verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away, and he who sits on the throne says, behold, I'm making all things new. Brothers and sisters, we have a hope that is a living hope. And he lives in heaven, having conquered sin, having conquered death, having given us promise upon promise upon promise. Think of any situation in life. Write them down on a piece of paper. What are you hoping for? What are you, what are you longing for? And then look to the scripture, open up the word of God, and find and discover with joy and gladness and with perseverance the hope that he offers for anything and everything that you are struggling with. But ultimately, our hope is in him for the salvation of our souls, is it not? That's the hope that he gives to us that we can be assured about. So with that, let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, 
we thank you for the hope that you have given to us, such a rich and deep hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we think about all the, the trials and struggles and difficulties and obstacles and hurdles that we have in life and face in our life, Lord. You are the hope for every single one of them. But I thank you most of all that your promise of fulfilling on, 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 on all of your promises to give us hope is real. This world, Lord, is sad to, sadly, um, doesn't have true hope. It's a self-conjured up hope, which, which is not a true hope we know, Lord. But I thank you that for your children, you give to us faith, which is the assurance of things hoped for. And Father, I pray for each person here, Lord, as there are, are things that um, sometimes we're discouraged about and, and sometimes we feel hopeless about. And so, Father, I pray that your spirit would minister to each person and that as they open the word of God and, re- and, and meditate and reflect on and discover and, and dig into these amazing truths of Scripture, Lord, that they would be encouraged with the hope that is laid up for them in heaven. Father, we thank you for this, this Christmas season, and I pray, Father, that we would remember that uh, this great truth as we get together with our families and our friends to celebrate the incarnation, the birth of our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.